Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. I am My Life is Torn. Today we're taking a look at acrostic grooves. So let's jump into the game. The cool night air helps me to collect my thoughts. A little further away on the sidewalk, I make out the familiar shape of John Baptiste. He's smoking a cigarette. The John Baptiste that I know has stopped smoking. We stop together. I fumble in my coat pocket. I pull out a packet of galut. Galoises, half empty. It shouldn't be there. There's no rational explanation why I should have a pack of smokes on me. Unless... John Baptiste has seen me. He smiles at me. Can't stay here, staring in front of him. I can't stay here, staring at him from a distance. I have to take a decision, but I don't know if I should turn away or go and talk to him. I hesitate. Go near. I go near. John Baptiste rummages through his pockets and holds a lighter out to me. I notice that I still have the packet of cigarettes in my hand. Take one out and let him light it for me. This man, who I was making plans for the future with just yesterday, is watching me with indifference, mildly disturbed by my distress. I'm a stranger to him, and it hurts badly. And now there he is, right in front of me, waiting for me to answer. Yes, fine, thanks. It's just that, how should I say it? My day's been emotional. Hmm, get exact. I get exactly what you mean. We're on a slippery slope, which I decide not to continue down. I don't know how I'll react if he asks me what's happened in my day. I know he's about to do just that. Haven't we met already? Your face looks familiar. I don't think so. I'd remember you. Do you often drink here? He nods towards the window behind me. Maybe you just saw me in there sometime. I come here a lot. I don't know. Maybe. Probably. John Baptiste drops his cigarette in and crushes it with his foot. Sorry, but I have to go. Do you want me to ask Michael to get you a taxi? No, no, that's kind, but it's fine. He starts back to the bistro, then changes his mind and returns to pick up his cigarette end. He takes the chance to look at me again, as if he was searching for an elusive memory or a word on the tip of the tongue. He flashes me an embarrassed smile, accompanied by a good night before disappearing into the bistro. I stay where I am in the cold, dragging on my cigarette, my heart in my shoe. I go out on the back balcony and light a cigarette. As I stand musing, I look at the apartment and I'm aware of, the, of a number of small differences that I hadn't noticed earlier in the day. There's no phone charger or small coins in the bowl on the dresser in the hallway. The old games console, which had never been plugged back in since the move, is no longer on a shelf under the TV. The big photo of New York has been replaced by a tattered old poster from a regional rock music festival. The record, though, still dominates the kitchen table, exactly where I left it earlier in the day. Seems impossible, but it's as if, by putting the 45 on the turntable, I truly returned to my past, as if by choosing to run after Ulysses the night we broke up, I hadn't met John Baptiste at the bar, as if I'd returned to a present where I'm single, where, Bob, where John Baptiste and I never met. I could try listening to the record again to get to the bottom of this, but I'm afraid of making things worse. If it really does have the power to change my past, it could have catastrophic consequences on my life. What do they call that again? The butterfly effect? I hope Mark will help me to clear all this up. At least he should be able to tell me what's happened to Ulysses. The store that Mark shared with Ulysses is in a little semi-pedestrian street on a corner. I used to come by here almost every day after my college classes a few years ago. When I push the door open, I'm assailed by the characteristic odor of old records, similar yet distinct from the smell of old books. The big speakers fixed to the ceiling blare out a strident fuse. 
The big speakers fixed to the ceiling blare out a strident fuzz guitar solo at a volume theoretically much too high for a business establishment. I'd be incapable of saying whether it was some obscure 70s garage band or post-rock movement contemporaries trying to imitate their elders. Mark is reading the sleeve with interest. Only when I reach the other side of the counter does he deign to look up. He smiles at me, then murmurs something incomprehensible in the din. I gesture to him that I can't hear anything pointing at my ears. He flaps his hand at me to wait, then turns the volume on his amp down to something better adapted to conversation. I was saying, I was saying they're a local band. Pretty powerful, huh? I've signed them for an EP. I just got the pressing. What an amazing, what's so amazing with Mark is that even if we haven't seen each other for probably over a year, he behaves as if we spent yesterday evening together. Hello, Mark. Are you okay? Everything's cool. Thanks. And you? What brings you down here? Have you heard from Ulysses lately? No. Mark seems a little surprised at the question. Now you mention it, it's been an age. The last I heard, he was in Paris. But when I say last, that was six months ago. I called him for a customer who was looking for Magma Originals. After, it's true we've kind of lost contact since. Mark breaks off. I guess that in some way he must blame me a little for what happened between Ulysses and me, seeing as how our breakup also cost him his business partner. Anyway, so no, no news of Ulysses lately. But why do you ask? He sent me a record. I decided to get straight to the point. He sent me a record. A record? Yes. No note, no explanation, no return address, nothing. Just a vinyl record in a package. To tell the truth, the only clue that told me that it came from him was his handwriting for the address. Mark watches me with an odd intensity. Did I spark his interest when I mentioned this record? Or is this something else? Concern? Or fear? Could you describe the record for me? I can do better than that. I'm about to fish the record out of my bag when Mark gestures me to stop. He hails someone who's rummaging in the reggae afrobeat box behind me. Hey, sir! He's... His target turns with an air of feigned innocence. He's a guy in his 50s. He wears a black leather biker jacket and snug matching pants. His hair, which is slick back rockabilly style, is considering his age the improbable uniform black of a bottle of hair dye. Can I help you? The guy grumbles in discontent shakes his head and saunters towards the exit. Mark waits for the closing door to ring the bell hanging above it before continuing. Did that guy follow you by any chance? Follow me? Yes, follow you. How should I put it? Have you had the feeling that you're being watched since you received the record? Yes, I've had that feeling. Yes, I had that feeling of being followed yesterday evening on my way home. But, well, I figured I was being paranoid. Why would somebody tell me? Anyway, why would you suspect that guy specific, especially? Mark can't repress a smile. Two things. An old rockabilly who I don't know in my shop. They're an endangered species. I guarantee they all come in here, no exceptions, at least once a week for a coffee or a beer. They never buy anything, but they're cool, and they've always got amazing stories to tell. Okay, that seems like a bit of a stretch, but never mind. And? A guy in leathers and boots going through the Afrobeat box for 10 minutes, if that's not suspicious. I burst out laughing. Okay, that is very suspicious. You're right. Mark leans over the counter to check who is actually in his shop. 
There's a couple of students giggling in the depths of the shop and a guy meticulously comparing the covers of two copies of Frank Zappa's Hot Rats. The headphones of the open access turntable clamped over his ears. Okay, the coast clear. I slipped the record from my bag and placed it on the counter. It's a 45. White label, a test pressing. No scribe number in the groove. One of two sides is a mirror side. Mark smiles. You haven't forgotten the jargon then. After all the time I spent with you, Lissy, I think it's lodged in my brain forever. You can put... You can put it away. I know what it is. Really? It's not a white label. It's an acetate. A single copy. That's why there's no matrix number. I put the record back in my bag. But I'm surprised you don't recognize it. You Lucy unearthed it a while before you split up. It was the only record he wanted to keep when he left. Which meant I had to buy his share of the stock. I would have preferred that he take the psychedelic shelf. It would have saved me taking out a bank loan. Did you listen to it? Yes, I put it on once on the headphones. That was quite enough for me. Oh yeah? Look, I'm no angel, right? I know the effect of psychedelics, mushrooms, LSD, mescaline, salvia. I've tried pretty much everything, but I've never had a trip like the one that record took me on. Me either. I don't much want to listen to it again. At least not until I know a bit more. Mark smiles. There are quite a few legends going around about that recording, you know. Some people claim that it's the last recording of a Delta blues man who made a pact with the devil. It's kind of the holy grail of record collectors, if you see what I mean. There are plenty of crazies who say it's got magical powers. If I were you, I'd be very careful. That record attracts trouble. And to be honest, it makes me pretty anxious about Ulysses. It's obviously the most precious thing he possesses. Him sending it to you by post like that, that's not a good sign. After everything you've just told me, yes, it is worrying. Do you have his telephone number? The simplest thing would be to try to reach him for a start, right? Mark nods and picks up the handset. He hangs up a few seconds later. It's sending me direct to his answer phone, telling me my correspondent's voicemail box is full, which isn't totally surprising with Ulysses. We're interrupted by the sound of the bell which hangs above the door. A young girl with a striking 60s style approaches the counter. She asks shyly if there are any tickets left for Bell and Sebastian next month at the Femina. Mark takes the tickets from beneath the counter and makes a sale. I gaze after the young woman as she leaves. Mark clears his throat loudly at me. He watches me with a smirk. I realize that I was probably staring at his customer so hard that he noticed. Anyway, what were you saying? That Ulysses is impossible to reach and that that's not really surprising. I'll give you his address if you want. Do you go up to Paris sometimes for work? Mark grabs pen and a paper. It can happen, but like once a year, max. In any case, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Same for me. I just got back from vacation. It'd be kind of tricky to justify a trip to Paris. I've written down his number too, just in case. Mark gives me the paper. The first to hear anything calls the other, right? I nod. Thanks, Mark. You should drop by more often. It's good to see you. As they say, don't be a stranger. You're right. You're right. I'll try to come by more often in the future. My apartment looks like a bomb site. I had sensed that something was wrong as soon as I entered the communal areas. The door of the apartment was already ajar when I pushed it open, and I prepared myself for the spectacle I was about to confront. 
Every square centimeter has been carefully searched, every closet emptied, every drawer turned out. I pick up a cushion which, lay which lays on the living room floor and replace it on the couch before dropping down next to it, dejected. I realize that Mark's warnings weren't unfounded. Someone really wants that record, and that person is ready to enter my home while I'm away to achieve their ends. Was it the old rockabilly who was spying on me in the record store? He didn't seem particularly dangerous. On the other hand, a record with the power to change the past. I totally understand that someone might want to get a hold of it, even if that means breaking a few laws along the way. I guess there are a few things that I might be tempted to change myself. I take out my phone and dial the number that Mark gave me. Maybe I'll be luckier than him. You never know. Apparently not, because I am also welcomed by the recorded operator's voice telling me in a monotone voice that your correspondent's voicemail box is full. Beneath the number, there's an address in St. Owen. I know what I have to do. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to be notified for future content. All my social media is going to be linked in the description. I also stream on Twitch at twitch.tv slash mylifeistorn, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye!